Welcome, everyone, to the ARCHICAD User Group Hangout. Today is October 28th, 2014, and this is Eric Bobro speaking to you from San Rafael, California, where it is a beautiful, sunny fall day. Um, we're getting started about 15 minutes late due to some technical issues. So even though I am a technology consultant and generally know my way around things, um, I uh, don't use these this particular technology called Hangouts on Air very often. Um, I like Hangouts on Air. It's a free tool from Google because uh, it does have, uh, at least the tool that I use it with, uh, does have a chat feature. So you can um, type in your questions in your chat um, here uh, into the chat box. And you can see each other, or at least see comments. And I think that makes for a little bit more of a um, experience like you are in a user group all together sharing this. Um, now, uh, I do have an agenda. You know, I'm going to be going over a few things. Let me just pull up my agenda here. Um, I'm going to be sharing some observations about Graphisoft and Archicad, uh, some things that have been going on recently, and uh, just the way I see things as of today. Uh, we'll look to see your comments as well. I'm going to do uh, ask you a few questions. I have something set up for uh, polls. So basically, I'll put up a question on the screen. It'll be a choice of you know two or three answers. These are not you know to test your knowledge. It's more just to get a, a, a sort of a survey of to see what you feel. So I'll be asking a few quick questions. Um, then I'm uh, going to be sharing some news from my side. In other words, uh, you know things that I want you to know about. And then we'll do an open Q&A. So I have some questions that were sent in ahead of time. I'll be switching to share the screen in Archicad um, and demonstrating some answers. And uh, you can also type in some questions, um, you know, when that comes up or follow-up questions, you know, clarifications. Uh, so uh, let's see. First thing I want to share is about the Blue Beam acquisition. This um, here, I'm going to go switch to um, Let's see, uh, show my, I'm going to share my screen. So this should work. Let's see if this can, can work here. Uh, I'm going to go and change from showing my video to showing my screen here. Let's see, it's this one here. And you should see something a little bit odd there. Um, Okay, so that might be a little bit odd uh, for a moment because of the way that the Google Hangout works. Um, but uh, let's see, here's uh, some news. Some of you may have uh, seen this, that Nemechek, which is the company that owns Graphisoft, it purchased Graphisoft back in, I don't know, might have been 2008, somewhere uh, in there. Uh, so quite a few years now. Nemechek owns a number of um, technology companies in the architecture and engineering space. Uh, so in addition to Archicad or Graphisoft, which you know we think of mainly as the one product Archicad, it also owns Vectorworks. Um, and it owns a structural solution called SCIA, or S-C-I-A, I think it's pronounced SCIA. It owns um, Maxon, which makes Cine, uh, Cinema 4D. And I believe it has some other um, products. Uh, the, the actually, the original company, Nemechek, which still exists, uh, has its own product called AllPlan, which is actually pretty comparable to Archicad in terms of being a general all-around um, 3D modeling um, BIM solution. Now, Nemechek uh, recently acquired a program, or actually a company called Bluebeam, and they spent quite a bit of money, $100 million. Um, so this was not a trivial uh, or a small purchase. Now, Bluebeam uh, makes uh, software for dealing with PDFs, um, PDF-based digital processes and collaboration. Um, now, uh, by the way, um, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, so, are you seeing my screen? By the way, are you seeing the uh, this screen about you know Nemechek acquiring Bluebeam? Uh, let me know that. Um, okay, so um, waiting to see that you make sure you're seeing that. Um, 
So tell me if you can see can see the screen that I'm sharing. And uh, not seeing any more chat. Come on. Um, okay, I'm going to go on. Let me know. I, I think there's a little bit of a delay uh, here. Now, why is this important? Um, PDF is certainly widely used throughout the construction industry. In fact, Bluebeam, um, OK, so everybody says, yes, you can see the screen. Uh, I guess it was just a little bit of a delay there. Um, so Bluebeam um, complements BIM solutions. But even more than just sort of adding another little tool, um, it firmly establishes Nemechek, you know, the company that is behind Graphisoft and Archicad, as a major player in the US market. Because in fact, um, I think if we look here, it says in this other one that Bluebeam is used by 74% of top US contractors and 64% of top US design firms. So that means that with a single stroke buying Bluebeam, Nemechek now has a customer relationship with two thirds of the top US firms. Now, of course, I'm sure Bluebeam is used in other countries as well, but in the US, you know, Archicad um, has certainly struggled against Autodesk's machine um, in the larger uh, firms. And this won't instantly change things, but it does open up the door. Now, if you think about how Apple uh, made a big turnaround in part because they had products like, you know, the iPod that were just so cool. They were, you know, essentially so far ahead of other competing products um, and that there was a halo effect. Of course, the iPhone as well. Um, and eventually Apple was able to turn around from being a, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, from being a fringe player. And let me just uh, blow this up a little bit because I think it might help. Uh, Apple um, uh, was able to turn around from, you know, being a fringe player and, you know, who, who uses Apple sort of thing to being, you know, one of the most respected brands in the world and, in fact, uh, the largest um, public company in terms of market cap, capitalization. Uh, so I can't project that for Graphisoft, but I can say that by having a larger portfolio and actually, um, you know, already a customer relationship with these large U.S. firms, it will allow Nemechek to establish itself more fully as um, a top four player. So who are the top four? Um, we have, of course, Autodesk. We all know that. And let me just blow this up um, here. So Autodesk, obviously, number one. Bentley, number two. Uh, some of you know Bentley well, but others uh, may not know um, Bentley and MicroStation um, you know, handle large percentage of the architecture engineering projects you know, like bridges and, and uh, subways and, and uh, airports and things like that. So they are a huge player. And then there's an interesting player that many of you may know, but some may not, called Trimble. So Trimble has uh, uh, now developed its own suite of different uh, design software, including they bought recently Geary, Frank Geary's um, technology. Uh, so Geary Technology is now part of Trimble. They own SketchUp. And they own a variety of other tools. Um, and so they have become a major player in the software side. They, I think they've always had a, a strong presence in um, some of the surveying and construction management. But, um, and they also own Vico software. Um, so Vico is the constructor tool that was originally built on top of Archicad, but then became independent. So now we have four major players worldwide. And with Nemechek acquiring Bluebeam, I think it's sort of, I wouldn't say it's even the playing field, but it's definitely coming up to the, the, the table and saying, you know, we are, you know, we really need to be treated as, you know, one of the major players. So that's good for Archicad, I think. Um, you know, the uh, another thing that uh, this relates to is that, um, you know, in Archicad 18, uh, we have uh, Cine Render, so the new rendering technology that came directly out of Cinema 4D, which is another one of the companies um, or products that is owned by Nemechek. And so we're now seeing some, you know, direct technology connections saying, all right, they've got great rendering over in this other tool. And now um, we have uh, the, um, you know, th that technology within Archicad. Uh, now, 
Some other announcements here that I wanted to comment on. Um, BIMX Docs. So BIMX Docs is um, something, let's just make this a little bigger. Um, so BIMX Docs is the version of the BIM Explorer that uh, Archicad or that Graphisoft created uh, and released just about a year ago um, in October of last year. And it uh, was originally only for iOS, so for iPads and iPhones. Uh, they did release uh, a version for Android. Now, BIMX Docs, if you haven't played with it, is a phenomenal way to share your project in 3D along with 2D documents. Um, so you can actually, on an iPad or now on an Android tablet, you can browse through essentially similar to a PDF, the entire drawing set, but then click on links, let's say click on a section marker, and it'll take you to the section drawing, but it'll also flip up to show you a 3D model of where that section came from. So you can actually quickly, if you want, see the relationship between these 2D and 3D components. So it's a very, very slick thing. They've now released it for Android. I think that's great. Uh, it's now available, you know, sort of on any portable device. Um, and my guess is that they will release a version for desktop at some point um, because it, it would be a natural extension um, there. So I see a comment from Carolyn saying, BIMX Docs is amazing for wowing clients. That's, uh, I, I agree. Um, so uh, be interested in, in hearing more about that. Carolyn, perhaps you can drop me an email um, separately and let me know how you've been using it, but or just type it into the chat box. Uh, and but the one problem is I only see some of the chat messages because um, uh, there's it's only a small area that I'm able to see it. Um, so I might miss what you type in. Okay, so I think this is a nice um, uh, development there. Uh, I think that um, uh, another one that uh, uh, perhaps you've heard about is BIM Clouds is another development for. Um, Archicad. This actually was sort of made public in um, March, I think. Uh, BIM Cloud is a, sort of an extension and an, um, uh, sort of an over, overseeing management tool for the BIM server. Uh, so BIM server is um, the uh, teamwork uh, tools for making an Archicad project be accessible for more than one user in the office or remotely. And BIM Cloud uh, adds some very high powered management tools to allow larger firms in particular um, to share projects on multiple BIM servers. And it just has a lot of um, management uh, ability. Now, Graphisoft and Archicad has not had great success with larger firms in the US. I mean, there are a handful of firms that you know, were at one point 100 people or, or so uh, that were um, Archicad champions like Kirksey in Texas and Orchid Winslow down in uh, Arizona are two of the ones I recall. Uh, but for the most part, those firms that are 100 plus uh, and certainly the ones that are multi-thousand um, never really adopted Archicad. Um, they may have looked at it. In fact, I helped some of them look at it, uh, but you know they got sweet-talked or straight strong-armed by Autodesk to say, don't look at that stuff, look at our our stuff. Um, now, it's very different in other parts of the world. For example, in Japan, apparently three or four out of the top five architectural um, companies, and we're talking about, you know, thousand people plus, you know, two or three thousand in some cases, um, have standardized on Archicad as one of their major tools, uh, if not the only tool, but one of the major tools. Now, why did that happen? It became, it happened for a few reasons. One is, if you're outside the U.S., there's less reason to say, you know, well, we got to go with the number one player that's the U.S. company. You know, in other words, uh, they don't have a loyalty to say, well, we're going to go with Autodesk because it's the number one in the U.S. You know, they're looking for what's the best solution for their needs. And I think uh, Graphisoft really put a lot of effort into developing custom support for the Japanese market. Now, what that says is, you know, Archicad is doing well in some really large firms. And BIM Cloud is a natural extension of that to allow you know, these large projects, large firms to work. And they've extended it to mobile devices. Now, I haven't really looked at it, and I haven't seen this um, webinar that's going to be coming up in a couple of days. Uh, but it appears that, that you'll be able to take the virtual building model uh, 
and share it not only with the desktop users where they might be designing, um, but also with mobile users where they can mark it up. So that means that uh, you can extend the process of design development and even construction management potentially um, to people on site all over the, the world um, with messaging and things like that. Now, in conjunction with, let's say, um, Bluebeam and the PDF markup tools, we now are seeing a more robust ecosystem uh, related um, uh, to, um, we're seeing a more robust uh, ecosystem related to this workflow from design through construction uh, for teams of all different sizes um, and uh, teams that have different disciplines, obviously engineering and other uh, ones as well. So I think that Graphisoft is thinking wider and broader and connecting more um, stakeholders in the process. And I think this, this is a great sign. You know, uh, Archicad itself is a great solution, but in order to succeed in the larger picture, it needs to support um, and connect to these other tools. Um, okay, now uh, I see a comment from um, Jeff, uh, just lost audio and video streaming has frozen um, here. Um, okay, the seminar, you don't have a picture. Um, okay, so I'm not quite sure. Are you not getting the, the, the picture here? Um, I was, um, so the BIM Cloud um, here, this particular um, release here, let me just copy this. Um, so let me just put this in here. Um, that's a link. And then the, um, uh, so that's a thing there. Um, oh, the webinar, I didn't, uh, I thought I had a link for the webinar that is going to be here. Where is the webinar? I um, thought that there was a webinar. Oh, here is the webinar for the registration here. So let me copy this. And um, um, OK, so um, all right, so these, these are two um, links that you can um, uh, go check out uh, there. I, I hope they don't take you out of your um, uh, watching this. Um, I see some comments saying it's fine here in Australia, other people audio and video okay. So thank you for letting me know. Um, okay, so uh, let's just see. Um, last things that I wanted to just observations. Um, you know, in the US, uh, I think that, you know, we were all hit pretty hard with the recession. Some, you know, super hard, some, you know, just suffered a little bit. Um, and I, I think Graphisoft North America certainly had its challenges. Um, and uh, one of the things that they did uh, is to transition from being focused on all sales being through resellers, like I was a reseller for 20 years, to doing a lot more direct sales, um, which, you know, helped make the company more profitable. After all, if you're getting all the, the proceeds from, you know, uh, purchase, then that's more profitable than sharing that with, you know, uh, another company like my company selling it. Um, so they still have some resellers in some areas, which is great, and they sell direct in others. And what's happened over the last few years is um, they've staffed up. They've increased um, the uh, um, what do you call it? They've increased the the number of people on staff, both for sales and support, I believe. And I, I'll tell you, very. I had a very pleasant experience the last uh, few weeks. I've called in twice to tech support um, here in the US. Um, you know, one time my key was not responding and I wondered if the key was broken or something. Uh, I reached tech support directly. I called the phone number and, you know, I was on hold for, I don't know, a couple of minutes and then someone picked up the phone and he was able to help me. Um, I think his name is Kevin, if I'm not mistaken. But um, uh, you know, spent 15 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, and walked me through a couple of things for reinstalling drivers. I don't know why the drivers got messed up, but I was back and up and running very quickly. And there was something else I called about, um, you know, a few weeks ago that was also, you know, got immediate uh, help on. So I just wanted to say that Graphisoft in, here in North America, you know, their tech support uh, seems to be, you know, handling things well in the sense that, you know, I didn't have to wait an hour or a day uh, for a callback, got uh, you know quick support, um, and of course, knowledgeable,
friendly expert support. So I, I want to report on that. Now, related to that, I was uh, talking to him about Yosemite. So uh, what is Yosemite? Um, uh, Yosemite is the new operating system for the Mac um, that just came out uh, in the last, um, what was it, you know, uh, week or two, something October 17th here. Um, so very recently um, it was released. So in general, it's supposed to be a good operating system. I'm planning on upgrading to that shortly. Um, Apple has taken the radical step of making their operating system free, so you can upgrade without a charge. Now there are some cautions if you're an ARCHICAD user um, that uh, you need to make sure you back up everything, uh, upgrade while you're not on a deadline, because if there are any issues, you may lose time, and you don't want to have that affect your deadlines. And in fact, just to be extra sure, make sure that you could go back, that you have ways to, uh, in terms of the operating system, to go back to, to revert to the previous operating system if necessary. So that's the extreme case where things just don't work properly. So there's more information here on, um, you know, uh, this this particular link here is a nice one, a nice article from Jared Banks, um, and uh, uh, here. Um, okay, so uh, uh, I'm seeing some good comments. Um, tech support has been very responsive. Adam says, Donovan says, I had a great experience with tech support and got them directly as well. They solved my key issue and stayed on the phone with me, and it was great. Uh, Donovan also says, I was a beta tester for Yosemite and had all kinds of issues with ARCHICAD. I have it now and it works fine except for BIMX on desktop, it has an issue. So yeah, there is something, I think if I go to the link um, here, click here um, to stay up to date on ARCHICAD and BIMX compatibility testing. So here is on um, in the help center under Graphisoft. So I guess if you go to graphisoft.com and you go to help center, uh, then look up Yosemite, you'll see stuff. And um, uh, so it says that 17 and 18 are supported for Yosemite. There may be some small issues, but they're going to be working on those. 13 to 16 should run, although if there are issues, they're not going to make it a big extra effort to make sure they work. Um, and known, known issues like BIMX cannot run, um, but there will be an update uh, for that. Um, you know, so there are some small issues there. Um, okay, uh, Michael says there's a problem with Yosemite and printing PDF from ARCHICAD should have a hot fix soon from Graphisoft. Okay, um, and Harley says Graphisoft New Zealand has advised against upgrading to Yosemite. So the general advice is while it's nice to upgrade to that, you aren't going to get so much benefit that it's worth a risk and therefore wait a little bit, let other people, you know, deal with some of those and then you go in, you know, with a second wave. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, this is, uh, Donovan says, my BIMX doesn't work right on Yosemite for some reason. That is no known. It says BIMX cannot be run on this um, here. Okay, so, but Evangelo says, I've been using Yosemite with ARCHICAD with no problems so far. So, there you go. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. Use caution. Um, certainly, if you're an early adopter, feel free to go ahead, but do follow the, um, you know, the tips, I think uh, Jared has some some good ones saying, <laughs> you know, uh, pick an appropriate time when deadline pressures are minimal and have computer restoration method in place. Okay. All right. So I have some polls here. Let's see how this works. I've never used these polls. Um, let's see. I'm going to click on polls and say uh, this. So I'm going to click on this and I'll say start poll. All right. So I have put up a poll here to um, say, are you using ARCHICAD 18 or an earlier version? So hopefully you see this pretty quickly without delay. Um, the options are yes or earlier version. So you know, you're not on 18, but you're using an earlier one, or I'm not using ARCHICAD yet. I'm assuming that if you're on here, you're if you're not using it yet, you might use it sooner or later. So um, I'm on 18. I'm going to vote here. Um, this, so I voted, and uh, I'll make results public at the end of the poll. Um, here, are you seeing it? Um, okay. So I'm not quite sure how long this to let this go because I, I let me go back to the chat. Are you seeing the? Um, you guys seeing the poll? 
you, I think you can switch between the poll and the chat. I'm not quite sure how it looks from your end, um, but please type into the chat and let me know um, that you got it. Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to just assume that it was seen. I'm going to end the poll. And OK, so I do see, yes, 55% of you on this call are using Arcade 18, 45% earlier, and zero are saying not using Arcade. OK, cool. Um, so let's let's try this next one here. We'll start the poll. So this is how happy are you with Arcade 18? So for those of you using it, um, you know my choices that I gave you, it's great, love it, or it works OK, or I've had problems. Um, and so you know, let's see how long it takes to, you know, please respond right away so we can move through these. I have about five questions like this, so we can move through them pretty quick. Um, here, and let me just um, go back to where I'm uh, stop screen sharing. And uh, so hopefully you see me and you still have the poll there. Okay, so I'm going to say it's, for me, it's great. And uh, let's say poll ended, and OK, 62% say it's great, love it. 33% say it works OK, and 5% say I've had problems. OK, so if you've had problems, be interesting to see. Um, uh, and did I, um, you should be seeing the results. I said make results public at the end of the poll. Are you seeing those? Um, it's all sort of new for me. Um, OK. so. Let me know if you can see the results, because I, I did say I wanted to um, uh, do that. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, and by the way, are you seeing me on screen as well? All right, so is your office getting busy with design work? Um, so options are, yes, we're slammed. Number two, we're getting busier. Or number three, business is slow, and we could use more projects. Just curious, trying to see. You know, generally, I think people are getting busier, but I don't really know. And this is a quick opportunity to get, um, you know, just get a, a sense from all of you. So I'll leave this up for a few more seconds. Um, here. OK, so uh, I'm going to say uh, we're getting busier. I'm going to vote, and I'm going to end the poll. All right, 53% say yes, we're slammed. 33% we're getting busier. And 15% business is slow, we could use more projects. OK, well, congratulations for those of you who are slammed. And great news for those getting busier. Sorry for those who are slow. Uh, I wish you the best. Um, and some of you may know that I'm working on uh, helping architects with marketing. So this is one thing I want to see. You know, Do you guys need help with our marketing? Uh, I'll be telling you about um, you know a an upcoming webinar that you might find useful. Okay, um, let's go on to the next one. If your office is busy, and so a lot of you said you were busy, um, do would you need more help or assistance? So choices are yes, we could really use more hands on deck, or no, we can handle it in house with current staff. Um, so. More hands on deck, I put it in general terms, that could mean hiring, like we're going to hire another staff person, or it could mean outsourcing, or you know, finding some other firm to partner with because you're just super busy. The um, reason I'm asking this is uh, I am looking at ways to help ARCHICAD users work remotely. Uh, some of you re may recall that I started an experiment to set up an online BIM server, a public BIM server, earlier this year. That sort of got put on hold as I got busy with other things, but I may bring it back. And also, I'm looking at you know ways to you know maybe help with outsourcing. Um, and also, the Arcad user website has a jobs board, and uh, so that may uh, be helpful. So um, I'm going to uh, do this. All right. So let's see the. Poll has ended, 53%. Yes, we could really use more hands on deck, 47%. We can handle it in-house with current staff. OK, so some of you definitely are getting so busy, you could use some help. All right, now how comfortable and productive are you with in, Ar in using ARCHICAD? So this is the second to last. Actually, this is the last question. So we'll be moving on to some other stuff. Um, so uh, options are you're an expert, 
you're using it to full advantage. Yeah, I mean, we can always learn some more stuff, but if you feel you're an expert, don't hesitate to say that. Uh, second option, getting the job done, but you know that you could use it better. And third one, trying to get up to speed, and you know you need to learn more. You're, you know, you're not up to the speed that you'd like to be or that you were before with whatever you were doing, whether it was uh, 2D CAD or hand drafting. Uh, or, you know, final option, you're a beginner, just getting started. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, here you are in this ArcCAD user hangout. You're in the learning process. Okay, so let's uh, end the poll here. All right, so uh, half of you are expert at the software. So I know that what that's saying is that experts like to connect with other experts. So here you are on this user hangout. And, um, you know, I'm glad you joined us. 45% uh, say getting the job done, could use it better, and then only 3% for each of trying to get up to speed or beginner. Um, so, okay, so for those of you who are getting the job done, could use it better. Um, you know, I'll just uh, remind you that I do have a training course called the Best Practices course that can make a big difference in how well you use ArchiCAD. I was really pleased. One of my longtime clients, going back to 1995, called me up just last week out of the blue. He had signed up for the best practices course, um, I don't know, a few months ago, not too long ago. And he had been using ArchiCAD for close to 20 years. And he said he had always, you know, always liked my work, but had always thought, you know, well, I don't really need another training course. I'm using it well. Well, he said, I went, I've been going through this stuff and I just can't get enough of it. It's made a huge difference in, you know, my productivity and what I'm able to do. So. I just want to say whether you go through you know the best practices course um, or something else, uh, self improvement, learning to use things better, very important. Um, even if you're a veteran, um, you know I'm continually studying and learning to try to do things better. Okay, so that's the um, end of all of the polls there. Um, so let's see. I'm going to go back to the chat um, here. So. Uh, John asks, how many are participating today? I don't know the attendees. It says there are 63 people here. Okay, so um, we had 170 sign up. I don't know if we lost some when we had the technical problems at the beginning. Um, okay, uh, so see some comments about results here. Um, all right, so Donovan says, I need the training course. I've been using Arcan since version eight and I just get by. Um, I know how to use it, but I need to be able to use it easier and better. Where do I get that course? Okay, glad you asked here. Um, so that's the link to the best practices course. And uh, those of you who are on the, the um, uh, this hangout who are members of the best practices course, feel free to you know say some comments about what you think about it and whether it's made a difference for you. Um, because these chat, you know, all the comments are certainly visible. So, okay. Um, Carolyn has a comment. I've tried a little outsourcing, but my insurance company requires UK-based professional indemnity insurance, which has been an issue. I can understand that there certainly are some, um, some extra concerns in terms of uh, liability when you have other people doing work for you. Obviously, Sometimes that can be worked around or you can, you know, you just make sure that you're reviewing everything carefully. You are taking responsibility, but uh, I'm not an expert on that. Um, okay. And Carolyn, are you UK based? I see a comment from Carmina. It is so hard to find ArchiCAD users in the UK. I live and work in London. So, okay. And Tony says, great course essential. So I guess Tony, um, I think I know which one you are. I'm only seeing first names for most of you. So. Um, I think I, I know you. Hello, Tony. Um, all right. Uh, so just moving on. Um, so I wanted to announce a couple of things that are coming up. Um, and then we'll get into some questions. So I'll do some demonstrations. We are running a little late because we started at quarter after, after some technical problems. So in terms of announcements, I have just a brief little teaser, which is that I'm looking to create um, and produce a um, program that I'm going to call Masters of ArchiCAD or Masters of ArchiCAD Summit, um, looking at February 2015, so just a few months from now, where in addition to myself, we'll have several, maybe as many as eight or 10, um, 
masters of ARCHICAD from around the world presenting um, something like one hour or 75 minute training in different things. I've um, you know been talking to Tim Ball, some of you know him in the UK, um, you know, he's a longtime client and, you know, we've been working together on different things, um, talking to a variety of other people. I don't want to name names until I've got, um, you know, them, you know, agreed, but I have quite a few others who are interested. And I think what we'll be able to do is, you know, have a wide range of presentations, whether it's on detail drawings or modeling in 3D in great detail or renderings, um, uh, you know, project templates, uh, that's probably something I'll talk about um, because I, you know, created master template and, and love how efficient you can get when you use a good template. Uh, so we'll have these things, obviously, um, you know, having experts who are using ARCAD every day and, in fact, sometimes uh, pioneering some uh, uses of ARCHICAD, uh, it'll be very exciting for, for me and I hope for many of you. So. Uh, don't have dates or, you know, the way it's going to be arranged, but probably something like a two-day virtual event, and it'll all be recorded and available afterwards. And there will be a fee for it, but we'll try to make it very reasonable. So, you know, it's, I would say, a great bargain um, in terms of the knowledge. So that's something I'm excited to um, share. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, for some of you um, who are looking for more work in your office, more projects to come in the door, or possibly are slammed right now, but know that you know it's up and down and there are times when you're not. Um, I want to encourage you to come uh, check out the um, uh, webinar that I'll be doing with uh, my partners, uh, Enix Sears um, AIA and Richard Petrie. Um, Enix Sears is a um, an architect in California I've been working with for the last year and a half. Um, we've been creating some training materials and resources for helping architects get more business, more work, um, you know, bring in more clients. And uh, Richard Petrie is an architect, he's a marketing coach and he's been working with us to focus on architect marketing. Um, and uh, we've, we've come up with a really kick-ass system, excuse the language, um, that uh, automatically brings in clients. And, you know, I, I think that sounds like hype and it sounds like an exaggeration, but it, it really is quite amazing how it works. Um, if you come to that webinar, you'll see some really um, useful things that you can do right now for yourself. And then we'll also have after an hour, hour and a quarter of training, um, that's all pure content, you know, no ads or anything, um, then we'll have an offer for something that's very affordable um, that'll help you to implement uh, this marketing system in your office. So check it out. If you're an AIA member, you can get continuing education credits. Um, so I put the link um, in uh, the chat box there, architectsmarketing.com forward slash webinar. So architect with an S marketing, architectsmarketing.com forward slash webinar. So we'll be doing several webinars over the next few weeks um, there. Okay, so I have some questions that were sent in ahead of time um, from a, a few of you. And I'd like to switch gears and bring up ARCHICAD and we'll see how that works here. So uh, actually, let's see, I have to bring up screen sharing again here. How do I do this? Um, so I'm going to screen share here. Um, and let me just start this screen sh screen share desktop one here. Okay, and then let me switch over to ARCHICAD. So please let me know that you can see my ARCHICAD screen. Um, and uh, let's see. So I'm waiting to see that, that you can see my ARCHICAD screen here. Um, now, uh, I'm going to go to a, sort of one uh, question that uh, I think there's some interesting options. Uh, it was sent in by uh, Josh Shade, and I'm not sure if Josh is out on the call, but, um, but I thought it would be something interesting to show. If we have, um, uh, I'll just create a building shape here. Um, okay, so we'll just... Great, so sort of an arbitrary 
quick shape for building. And um, here, so this is not going to not intended to be a let's say a sensible building, just something um, here. Okay, so question is, how do you get um, a list of areas, um, you know, for different parts of a building? Uh, what are some of the options? And uh, exporting it to a spreadsheet. So essentially working on program requirements um, in this form. Now, there are two ways that you can do this. You can either use the fill tool or you can use the zone tool. Uh, the simplest to set up and in some ways, you know, quite satisfying are the fill tool, the more sophisticated and, you know, more, let's say, something that can go deeper is the zone tool. So I'll briefly show you a couple of things about the fill tool that not everybody knows about. So when I activate the fill tool and I just click something, you know, you can see it fills the area with whatever fill um, that I've got. I could make this just a poche, you know, 25%, and now it's going to be more of a, a shade rather than, um, than line work um, there. Now, if I go to, um, if I select this fill, there is an option to show area text. Not everybody knows that that's there. It's, uh, let's say, a hidden gem, maybe. Turn that on. I click that, and you can see that it says that it's 286 square feet. If I make this a little different size, you know, just use the pet palette to edit it, you see instantly it changes that information. Now, this text here is something that actually can be moved around. I can select it and I can drag it independently of the fill. And now if I were to make the fill a different size, you can see how it, it did update, you know, it's staying current. So it's still connected um, there. And of course, if I turn um, the uh, this off, it disappears. If I turn it back on, it'll come back in the center. So you know, you don't want to turn it off if you want to put it off to the side in a certain location. So that's one way that you can get areas um, right on screen. One advantage of it is that it, as soon as the fill changes size, you get you know the update there. Now um, we can, of course, fill areas. So let me just eye drop this here. We can use the magic wand, so hold down the space bar and click. And the first click filled the area, the second click placed the, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, the area uh, number there. Let me just change the color here, so instead of being gray, let's um, you know make it another color here. Magic wand, click, second click, wherever I want that text. Um, now actually, guess this. Well, that's the outline. Um, that's not what I not what I wanted. I wanted to do this um, here. So now we've got a different color. Maybe we want something um, uh, a little bit stronger there. Okay. Since I had a twenty five percent, it's just picking up um, part of that. All right. So you can see that we can get some numbers there. How can we compile uh, those numbers? If we go to any of the schedules, let's just say door schedule. So pretty much every Archicad project based on a, a standard template, we'll have some schedules already in there. Once we do that, we can look at it. There's no doors right now, but I can go to the scheme settings and I can create a new scheme and we'll just uh, give it a name, um, you know, areas. Okay. And when we create this scheme, we have criteria here and the criteria is what is the element type? Well, in this case, I might be interested in fills. So now it's going to list fills. I say OK. And what do we have here? Actually, there's nothing inside here because although I said that it's going to list fills, I didn't actually have any fields. There's no data here. So what, what will I put in? Well, fills can easily have a surface area. So I can drag this across. And maybe I want to have something about the, you know, the fill type um, or uh, perhaps the ID. So these are things that will help me to tell which fills they are. And I can drag these up or down. So if I put ID at the beginning and the fill type, we can see those as the first ones. Now I say OK. You can see here's the ID is blank. Here's some fill type. OK, that's not very interesting. Solid. Remember the 25% was solid. This vectorial was that other one. And here's the area. Um, and I can widen this out here. So let me just go and say, um, uh, whoops, 
let me just go in here and say, you know, that fill type really isn't useful. It's, we'll remove it. Um, but we do want the name of the fill, I think. Um, let's see. Uh, what is the fill type image name? Building material or fill. This is the one we want. So this, um, if I put that in there, you know, here's the 25% um, uh, that we have. So that that's, could be of interest because we could actually name these things based on some uh, usage. Now let's just go back to the floor plan and uh, just give this an ID. So I selected the fill, go here to the ID, and we'll call this um, room one um, here. And I'll go to this one, and I'll call it room two in terms of the ID. And then let's go back to that schedule. And you can see here are the rooms coming in here. Um, now, of course, we, we might not care about the um, building material or the, um, the I'm sorry, the, this fill. But we're starting to be able to get a spreadsheet out of it. Now, um, if we uh, go down here and uh, let's say um, this was room one, I think, and let's eye drop this, and we'll um, pop in another one. So this is another gray one here, and we go down to the schedules. We're going to see room one twice, so we actually can have more than one with the same ID. Now, once we have the concept that the ID could be repeated, we can actually merge uniform items. Now remember, this is 258 and 288. If I say merge them, it now says 547. So it actually totals that up. So you can see how many maybe have the same usage if the ID refers to the usage. You can also say show a headline. And show headline allows me to see the room number or the, or, you know, the description here with the total. And if I don't merge this, then I start to be able to um, you know, show them separately. and if I wanted to total this up, in addition to showing it separately, I can go to the surface area and click next to it and click on this area here where it'll show either a blank, sigma, sigma one, or blank again. And sigma says total the all of these, and sigma one says give me a count, like how many rooms or how many items. So sigma, in this case, would give us the total for um, all of the areas that we're doing. Whereas um, if I click in this one over here, you can see this little flag icon. This is either off or on. If I turn that on, then it will group them. And so each time it changes, we're going to see um, a total here. Now, we're not seeing the total for room one. Let's see, we don't want. Um, that we want it, uh, the sigma to be when it changes material or actually when it changes ID here. So we're going to group it by ID. And now you can see room one and room two. So these then become usage um, things here. Um, so I see a question from Carolyn. What are the shortcut keys or how do you get the eyedropper and magic wand, uh, please? Okay, so let me answer that. So. Um, the magic wand is available by holding down the space bar. So if I press the space bar, the same one you use to separate words in a sentence, I get the magic wand. And whatever tool I'm in, for example, if I'm in the fill tool, it'll draw based on what it sees. So if I hold down the space bar, hold down um, uh, that and get the magic wand click, it's now putting in a fill there. Now on the other hand, if I had the slab tool here and I clicked, it would create a slab. This is a slab that I've got selected here. Um, and if I were to go to the outside and magic wand like this, then the slab is tracing the outline. So the magic wand can either trace the outside or the inside within some boundary with whatever is the currently active tool. Now, in terms of um, the uh, eyedropper, so the eyedropper the keyboard shortcut on the Mac is Option. So I hold down the Option key. On Windows, it's Alt. Um, and the, that is also available by clicking up here on the Pickup Parameters, which has the little icon of the eyedropper. Now, the syringe, which will inject things. So for example, if I wanted to eyedrop this one, um, let's go to, uh, now by the way, if you eyedrop on top of uh, something that 
um, you see there's a slab there and the slab tool is active. If I go to the fill tool and I eye drop, then it's going to prefer finding the fill tool. So I can eye drop this fill and perhaps inject it with the keyboard shortcut for the syringe, which is command option, or on Windows it would be alt control. So command option or alt control, depending on which platform, and then I can inject um, in that. Now, in, we picked up the, the fill and I want to inject it. Oh, I didn't put in a fill here. That's right. Um, I could inject it into this fill here. And now this fill picks up that color and, in fact, all of the other attributes um, about it. So while, let's say, I think for today's session, the zone tool has a lot of great power to do room uh, finish schedules and, and you know, do area calculations, but it's more complex. And sometimes it's just really nice to use the fill tool so you get some immediate feedback as you move things around and you can total it up in that, um, in that schedule. Now, the schedule that I created um, here, you can see the areas. That's the one I created. It showed up in the project map here, but we don't have a view for it in this folder because this folder in the view map is manually created. So if I go back to the schedule here and I wanted to save this as one of the standard schedules, then I can go and say save current view and we'll just I'll just leave it as areas um, here and you can see how it shows up now in this list um, there. So a couple of really basic things um, uh, there. Um, okay, so I see some follow-up questions. Carmina says, I'm interested in door and window schedule with renovation filters. How, how does it work? And Anne says, how do you create a new schedule in project maps? I want a new civil section to then place on a cover sheet with all sheets added in layout book. Um, okay, so I'm not quite sure um, about that. Let's take Carmina's question about renovation filters here. So to a door schedule, all schedules have something called the scheme settings. And when we go in here, you'll see that um, the criteria determines what's going to be included in this uh, schedule. So obviously, when I pick the door schedule, its first criteria is that it's looking for doors. It's not looking for other types of entities. Second part is it's excluding ones that are empty doors. Why? Well, if it is an empty door, it is a cutout in the wall, and you're not going to need to buy a door for it, so it's traditionally not shown in the schedule. But you can add other criteria. So for example, I can add a criteria by clicking this Add button, press down here, and choose what else I want to pay attention to. And one of them, in starting with version 15, when the renovation system was added, allows you to choose renovation status. And then you can say, I'd like to schedule only new doors. Or you might say only existing to remain doors or only demo doors. So depending on what you need, obviously new would pretty much always be needed, but you might say we need a list of all doors that are being demoed. That's certainly possible. So by doing that, we're saying we want only to list doors, skip the empty doors, and make sure that they're all um, new. And you see this and here, which has and or or. There are more complex things that, let's say, go beyond what I want to do today to do combinations uh, of things. And you can use parentheses to group them. So you can have you know, alternate things, things that are on one layer or another layer. And they meet some other criteria. So you can you know, say, or this, and then and something else. So those of you who remember your logic in college or whatever, you know, and and or and you know, uh, things like that. All right, so that's um, great. Um, now, uh, I guess an answer to Anne um, Rodrigo says you just need to save the view in the view map. It saves Zoom and other view settings. So, um, so when you when you do create a new schedule um, and you save that view, then you can place that that view onto a layout. So thanks, Rodrigo. Um, OK, Tracy says, is it possible to make any of the cells wrap the text? Yes, absolutely. Um, let's see if we have one. I'd, um, I guess uh, go back to the um, schedule. That's the uh, areas 
here. Um, now, uh, you see that where it says building material fill is, if I bring it back, hey, we have this problem, it automatically wrapped the text. But in this case, for the header, we'd want to drag this down and make this header size larger. So you can see how I can drag these um, directly. Now, if the text, uh, in terms of other things, um, like fields, uh, if I click on this, uh, anything, there is something that says wrap text. So if you had something that was notes, um, uh, just see if we could go in and do we have um, some notes here. So we could add in some custom text here so that it could be a description here. Let's just say that. Now, this is a field which is associated with every element. There's a, an ability to put in some custom text separate for it. And let's just say that this is um, uh, um, this is a long note. Okay, so I've just typed in this text here. It's a long note. It did wrap because it says wrap text. If I say do not wrap text, then it'll just truncate it. Now, if it is a long note and you have it wrapped, then you can see actually how it reconfigures um, uh, here. So this little checkbox allows you to um, to turn on or off wrapping for particular fields. Like, um, you know, we can have this one not wrapped. Um, actually, I guess, I guess wrapping, I guess wrapping affects, um, let's see if I turn this off here. Oh, okay, wrapping is a general setting um, for all of these value fields as opposed to the headers. Um, so, in any event, let's see here. Um, Okay, so Dave says, does the door or window schedule recognize doors or windows from the curtain wall tool? Good question. Uh, let's go to the uh, door types in here um, or door schedule um, and let's go to the scheme settings. Now, remember criteria in the schedules. Um, we had element type is door. Now, there is an option here under more that says, um, do uh, so we have door and okay I'm not seeing all door types I know that I've seen something listed here that says all door types or all window types I'm not seeing that there now let me let me just um, add a criteria we can say uh, and I'll move this up to the um, top we could say the element type is curtain wall um, or let's see if we go here, do we have more um, curtain wall panel? So this is a panel in a curtain wall, which could be a door or a fixed panel or a window. Um, so it's a panel and um, the element type is, uh, let's see, now do we get uh, the panel? Okay, so actually I haven't looked at this for a while and I'm not seeing exactly, um, you know, where the options are. I know that you you can list curtain wall doors or curtain wall windows or glazing or panels um, in a schedule. I'm not sure that you can actually have um, a, a schedule with both regular doors and curtain wall doors in the same schedule. I think that may be a limitation. Uh, I know it used to be and it may still be so, but you can play around with these things here. Sometimes if you do put in certain element types um, up here, you'll see more options appear down below. So in other words, as you choose certain things, it'll reconfigure what options there are. Um, but, uh, you know, that I think would require a little bit more study. Um, so I think one rationale for separating out traditional door schedules from curtain wall door schedules is that maybe you'd be ordering or specifying the curtain wall doors separately from interior doors or normal exterior doors. Um, but I'm not sure that that holds all, all the time, but that may be one reason why it can be separate. Um, okay, so Carmina says, uh, thanks Eric, everything seems so easy when you explain it. Well, um, I'm glad I'm able to shed some light on things. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so Anne says, I've had some issues with renovation settings translating into either a door or window schedule. I've had to Frankenstein multiple schedules together to get all the doors and windows in one. Uh, what is the best way to have all doors with reno at new, uh, to have all 
existing doors with Reno at um, at new to show up in one schedule. Okay, I'm not quite sure. Um, so in terms of Frankenstein, I understand at least one concept, which is that you might have one schedule that has certain types of doors and another schedule that has other types of doors, and you put them next to each other on the, the sheet, and they look like one schedule, but they're really not one, and maybe it's a little bit hard to maintain, because if you add a door or take away a door, maybe the length of one of them changes and you have to move things around. Um, in general, though, you, you can certainly uh, say renovations is new. Let's say if you wanted both new and existing to remain, but you didn't want the demo ones, you might go here and say put a parenthesis. See, it says criteria is invalid because we don't have a matching one. We might add another one and we'd say renovation status. Um, where is renovation status? Um, renovation status is um, uh, existing to remain, and we do maybe close parenthesis. All right, and we'd want to then change this to or. So you can see that it's saying that we're going to list doors that are not empty, that are either new or existing, but we'll leave out the demo. And the other possibilities you can say is not demo, you know, which would be the third category. So, um, you know, sometimes you can do additive things, it's new or existing, and sometimes you can say, oh, it's not demo, therefore it must be one of these other ones. But here is the parenthesis that may help you to um, include more things. Um, and I believe that one of the enhancements in Arquette 18 is that some attributes can now be combined from multiple types. So for example, if you're doing concrete and you had a list of concrete that are done with slabs as well as done with beams and maybe you have some profiled walls that have the concrete I think you can total them all up in one schedule um, and they'll somehow mesh together uh, whereas previously they might you know the the volume of the element might not have been listed in the same place so I haven't played around with that but I believe that they are trying to make it easier to have the schedules be more intuitive and comprehensive um, okay, so I, uh, I see a comment from Steve. Sorry, I'm missing most of this. Hope it is being recorded. It should be recorded and available on my YouTube channel after uh, the session is over. Okay, uh, um, and uh, I see a comment from Jeff getting two audio feeds, one about three seconds behind the other. Check to see, Jeff, check to see if you have two windows open, both connected to this maybe you have two tabs that are open there. Um, okay, so I did have some other questions that were sent in. Let me um, actually just bring that up here. Um, so Jeff, not sure if it's a Jeff who's been having problems with the audio feed, had Jeff Warren sent in automatic interior dimensioning. Um, let me just bring that question up and we'll see here. Um, Go to Hangout questions here, and um, okay, so here is a question using automatic interior dimensioning set for core only. The dimension line picks up drafting lines that I have to select one by one, and then he has to delete dimension extension lines. All right, now, well, since he didn't send me a file, let me just see if I can make a guess as to what this is. Um, so let's go here to um, this. And uh, OK, so if I um, do the automatic dimensioning, so this under the Document menu, Document Extras, Automatic Dimensioning. Now, automatic dimensioning is something that a lot of people don't know about. It's pretty cool and definitely useful although it has some limits. Now you notice that this is gray because I have to select things first in order to do it. So let me just select all the walls. So I just activated the wall tool, hit Command A, or if you're on Windows, Control A. It's now selected all the walls. Now I can go to the Document menu, Document Extras, Automatic Dimensioning, and I can either do Exterior or Interior. Let's do a quick Exterior Dimensioning. You'll notice that it asks a question about you know, what we're doing. Well, we don't have any windows or doors. Let me, before we do this, let's just put in a couple of windows or doors um, so we have some things here to... Uh, 
like that. All right, so um, let me go and select all the walls. Go to the, um, where am I? Uh, Struz, dimensioning. There are some options. You can have up to four different levels of dimensions, or you can turn some of them off. And this has to do with how far apart they are. You'll see that each of these dimension strings ha is spaced a certain distance apart. And I can say, place it on all four sides or just one side. Let's just go for broke. We'll put, place it on all four sides. And there's some options for what it's going to dimension in terms of doors or windows. But let's just say, OK. It says, click on an element to define the dimension direction or click the first point of the direction vector. So I'm going to click on an element, which would be, let's say, this wall. It says, click to place the first innermost dimension line. I'll take it out just a little bit. And you can see that's where that first dimension is. And if we um, look at this, you can see that there is a uh, an overall dimension that has broken by the windows, another one that is set up broken by you know, the interior walls. This one is an overall, and so is this. But if on the other side, we'll see that those outer two, one of them has the break in the wall here where the outside of the wall changes, and the other one is a true overall dimension. So that's called exterior, uh, automatic dimensioning for exterior. Now, all of these are fully editable. If I say, hey, I don't need this one because it's a duplicate, I can just delete it. Um, or I can select, you know, for example, these are getting in the way of that um, dimension of that. Uh, um, let's see if we want to select the dimension here. Let me hit the tab key to select that. I can just drag these, you know, up wherever I want. So they're, they're fully editable. Now, the question um, that came in from Jeff had to do with interior dimensioning. Um, and that we might say, if I select all the walls again, and I do document extras, automatic dimensioning interior, now it says, do you, if you do have some columns, do you want a dimension to the center of the column or to the endpoints? I don't have any columns. Do we want a dimension to the core only or the skin? Um, and let's just leave it with the default. And it says, enter first node of polyline. Basically saying, where do you want this dimension to run through? I'll take it from this side to here and complete the line by clicking again. And let's uh, I'll just pop it up here. So you can see that it dimensioned across the line here that I specified. Now these walls are um, simple walls. Select them and let's make them um, have some composition. So in ARCAD 17 and 18, we choose between simple or complex or uh, composite walls using this option here. In ARCHICAD 16 and earlier, we just choose from the pop-up which one we want, and they'd be grouped. But I'll, let me just put them all in, um, let's say, uh, you know, some complex brick um, thing here. Now, obviously, these interior walls wouldn't make sense to make them brick, so let me just change um, these interior walls, and we'll say that they're going to be just uh, two by four wood studs there. OK, so now um, you see that it dimensioned here the overall thing because the wall didn't have, um, it was not a composite at the time. In other words, it uh, at the time that I dimensioned it, it, it was um, not. But let's just try this again. Let me go to the wall tool, select all walls. Again, do automatic dimensioning, interior dimensioning. And we'll do the same thing, dimension core only. And let's um, say that I'm going to go and dimension a similar thing um, here. And now you can see that this dimensioned to the core rather than to the outside. Um, now, uh, the comment or the question that um, Jeff had to bring that up is, Dimension line picks up drafting lines, and so that causes issues. So basically, if I go in here, let's just take a, a line tool, and we'll say that this is a drafting line. So if we were to do some, you know, I'll just uh, So 
So I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm just drawing some, uh, some lines uh, in space. Now maybe this is going to demark something. It's some space. He apparently had some lines that were, you know, drafting lines here. If I select the walls, select all the walls, and do this document extra um, interior dimensioning and dimension core only here. And let's just go across here. Um, it's still, it still is going across to here. It did not do that drafting line. So I don't see what the issue is um, there. Let me just try selecting everything. So select everything here. And uh, now let's go to interior dimensioning um, here. And again, now you can see that this, this dimension did break at the drafting line. So it, it appears that one way that you can control this, Jeff, is to make sure that you're only selecting the walls rather than selecting everything with the arrow tool. So only select walls, it'll ignore um, that drafting line. The other possibility is, of course, you can just hide that drafting line, um, you know, turn off that layer before you do it. So hopefully that answers Jeff's question. Um, okay, so uh, I see some um, other related questions. Tracy says, how can I change just a few dimensions to all inches and have the rest of the dimensions feet and inches? Okay, so um, in there are different options in your dimension um, settings. Uh, here we have, this is in inches without feet. It doesn't say zero feet, four and a half. Um, of course, this is feet and inches. Let's just take a look at a couple of basic uh, options here. If I go to object, options, project preferences, dimensions, we are currently in a dimension preset called building scale, which says that it's going to display things that are under a foot just with um, inches. That's why, that's why we had the, uh, this here. Um, but if they are uh, in, um, what do you call it? Uh, if it's more than a foot, then it'll, of course, show that number of feet. Now we could switch, um, let's say we could switch this manually to, um, let's say, fractional inches. And now if I say, okay, we're going to see it has overall inches, not feet and inches. But you wanted to be able to change it for individual things. Um, now, basically, there's no automatic way to do that in one drawing. But you can do it in separate drawings. For example, in a cabinet drawing, um, you might want to have a different setting. So for example, um, I, I don't want, want to take the time to draw a cabinet drawing, but let's just say um, that uh, I wanted to do a detail um, drawing here. All right, so this is a, a detail. And this detail um, here, if I wanted to dimension this to um, uh, have dimensions come across with uh, um, uh, in inches, I might say that this particular detail, I'm going to do a save the view for the detail and say that it's going to use a millwork and details setting. So this is the dimension setting for this particular view, um, not a schedule, just put it in details here. So this detail now will have that view. If I were to dimension, um, you know, just put in a uh, new dimension, you know, between here, you can see how it's dimensioning in inches and actually would go down to probably 64th or some high degree of um, accuracy there. Now, if I go back to the floor plan um, here, you can see that when I double clicked on the floor plan, it's back to feet and inches here because the floor plan view is set to use this preset for dimensions. So basically each view can have a different, um, uh, in a different setting for the dimensions. But within a view, it's basically one choice or another. So uh, I 
hopefully that at least gives you some options that would be useful. Um, okay, Donovan says, my question is how to get the electrical plans to look the way I want. I've tried to get it to show my electrical plans that the furnishings, etc., are grayed out. Lighter gray lines and then the electrical outlets or fixtures are darker. Pens confuse me. Okay, we did have a question about pens and that brings up one that was sent in. Um, uh, actually, no, it was, where was it? Um, okay, so this is a related question here. Um, working with pen sets and uh, Brant's question had to do with AutoCAD line work that might be brought in um, and the pen set not having any variation in line weight. Now your question has to do with electrical plans. Both of them have to do with, at least in part, with understanding how pen sets work. Um, now I recognize that we're at 2.30, so we've been going an hour and a quarter since we actually got started, but an hour and a half since the scheduled time. So this is going to be a long recording. Uh, I'll go on for you know another few minutes. If you have to go, that's fine. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, and uh, certainly uh, I'm expecting that this will be available on YouTube um, in my channel uh, shortly after we finish. I think it takes a little while to process and then it shows up. Um, so I want to thank you all for Joining me, it looks like um, we've got uh, uh, 56 people still here. So definitely glad you're you're interested in following along here. Okay, and your feedback in terms of this, if you found it useful, um, you know, please share that with me either in the chat box or um, in uh, a follow-up email. I'd appreciate it because uh, I'll try to do these um, a little more often. You know, maybe maybe every month or two um, if I can. All right, so in terms of pens, let's talk about, um, well, let's, let's talk about the question that Donovan had about electrical plans. So if I go to, um, um, he was talking about having um, furnishings, etc. cetera, grade. Uh, so let's go put in um, an object and uh, um, put it on, well, actually, let's go to um, schematic design here. And uh, I've just put in an object will just go and put in some uh, ch whoops, chair here and and then let's go in and put in um, some electrical. So what would we have um, uh, would be under outlet here. Okay, so here's a um, floor outlet um, here. All right, now um, I have uh, this drawing, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really very crude. Um, these elements all were placed in with a, a certain pen. In other words, they were placed in. Uh, the color that we're seeing here is based on the um, overall settings here. And if we go to um, the appearance, the contour pen, the outline here is this brown pen, pen four, right? Um, now the uh, this electrical element um, here is set up right now also to use, um, let's see, it's 2D representation. Oh, it's using pen 102. It looks similar, but it's not the same as pen four. Now let's look at the pen set and, and say, um, if I go to the document menu, pen sets, pens and colors, you'll see that there are a number of presets here. When I change from, what's well, interesting, they actually have a new default for Arcade 18. I had not noticed that Graphisoft introduced a different detail, a default there. Um, now you notice that if, if I switch from the ARCAD default to Arch Pens Black, everything becomes black here. Or actually not everything, but many of the things become black. This one being up in Pen 102, and, and let's just change our on-screen to true line weight so we can see this a little better. Um, you can see this is um, brown. These are darker. Now, if I go to the pen sets and I say electrical plan, Notice what happened here. These became 
gray, and this stayed, you know, it's dark brown color. Uh, so let's go and look at the pen sets and see what this is doing. So if I go to pens and colors here, you can see that the electrical plan is set up to take the first row of pens and make them gray, whereas the standard ARCHICAD 18 default has many different colors. Now, it's different in for in the international version of ARCHICAD. There are other pens, you know, they have other pen sets, but the idea is that you may use one pen set for, um, uh, for designing. You may use another pen set when you're plotting where the first row is made prominent, clear, crisp black um, here. Um, and you might then have a separate one for, let's say, electrical, where the first row is gray, but things like that are up in another area. Um, you know, I guess where would 102 be? Um, so this is 121. 102 would be this one uh, here. So, uh, so basically, this made all of these become gray. Um, uh, so that the electrical elements could stand out uh, better. So the pen set can be changed on the fly like I just did, or we can go and, let's say, create a new view um, here with this pen set, and we'll call this view um, electrical plan. Now, we'd also want to look at what, what the layer combinations are and things like that, but let's just talk only about the, um, the pen set uh, here. So I say electrical plan. So now this is a view here. If I go back to schematic design, you can see how different it looks. So this is using a different pen set. So the idea for an electrical plan in general is that you're going to, of course, turn on and off different elements. Like, for example, we might want to turn off movable furniture, but leave fixtures. Um, so you'd have these on different layers and have a different layer combination. But we'd also perhaps want to make um, the pens a different uh, color. So that's sort of a quick introduction to pens and how they can relate to creating a variation of the model for output purposes. Um, so. Um, I see a comment from Mitchell. Great webinar. You're you're welcome here. Um, now let's see. Miroslav has a question about: Is there a way to change polyline orientation? Miroslav, can you um, expand on that? I don't know what you mean by polyline orientation. Um, maybe I'm just going to make a guess that that question might have to do with when you create the wall tool in a polyline and you're starting to draw this here. You can see the orientation of the wall is now, in this case, on the right on our screen. We can use this flip here. And now you can see it's on the left. And you can flip this at any time. So if I say, oh, no, really, I wanted it to be on the other side, you can see how it flips the whole thing. It'll flip all of the ones that I'm currently working on um, into that orientation. Um, so I hope maybe that helps Miroslav question. So in terms of the um, question that uh, was from Brandt about uh, pen sets, um, so he was asking about related to master template. We generally have the same pet sets in master template as Graphisoft supplies for the US or international versions. Um, so what I'm talking about applies in general, not just to master template. Now, AutoCAD lines with a white background, if you bring in an AutoCAD file, of course, it's going to be um, likely using a different standard for the colors. I can switch from the document menu pen sets to AutoCAD pens. Now, the variation that we have for AutoCAD pens is specifically for a white background. And when I do that, you see how everything changed here. Now, if you're an AutoCAD user, you know that, for example, Pen 7 is a, you know, a, a pen used a lot. Um, and given that AutoCAD often uses a, a black background, Pen 7 is set to be white. But here, Pen 7 is set to be black. Now, if you look at the rest of these colors, these are based on the standard AutoCAD pen set. In other words, it's actually literally um, uh, you know, matching the standard ones that Autodesk creates for you know, AutoCAD users. So it matches that. Um, now, if I draw this, you can see that that's black. If we had it match 
precisely, then this would be a white pen, and of course it would not be visible against a white background. So you could create your own pen set variation that would have it white, just like the standard ones. Um, but then you'd have to make sure your background that you were displaying this on was black, um, which could be changed under the view menu. Um, we have, uh, where is it? Um, grid and editing plane options, grids in background, where we could potentially change the background color to some other thing like gray or black. We could do that. I don't like doing it, but you could um, do that. So in any event, um, uh, the other question that Brandt had about uh, these pens is um, the corresponding pen set does not seem to have any variation in line weight. OK, so it, from what I understand, um, oh, here's, here's a sample project from Master Template that I'll just show you uh, the same sort of pen variation. We'll go to AutoCAD pens here. You can see totally different look here. Now, in the pen sets, um, if we go to pens and colors here, um, we can see the pen weights. Um, OK, there's no variations. These all say 0.51. If I go down lower, these are all hairline. They're 0.18. Um, etc. I think in uh, earlier versions of ARCHICAD, they might have, in the AutoCAD pens, they might have all been set to be zero, meaning hairline, um, you know, just the thin, as thin as possible. Uh, but apparently, it looks like this was changed um, so that some of these, oh, no, they're all 0.18. Okay. I thought, thought I had something that was thicker, or maybe it was because I was looking in point. There we go. Um, all right, so one of the things, just as a, a final comment about it, is that in AutoCAD, from what I understand, the, um, and I'm going to switch, because I, I need to finish up this for everybody's sake here, so I'm going to switch to turn off screen sharing and just bring back my lovely image here. So we'll um, stop the screen sharing. And, uh, okay, so um, just as a final comment about AutoCAD, um, set up in pens, uh, each office can potentially have the pens set differently in AutoCAD. So while there's some standard colors, there is no standard for the weights. So what you would need to do if you were bringing in a drawing from a manufacturer or from another company, consultant, um, and you wanted to have the, the pen weights match, you could create a copy of the AutoCAD pen set and manually change the weights to match the um, other company standards. There's no direct way, as far as I know, to import the pen table into ARCHICAD. That would be nice, but I don't believe there is one. On the other hand, when you do save out um, something for use in an AutoCAD environment, you save out a DWG, there is a way to save out from the pens and colors dialog a pen table, I believe. Um, so uh, I apologize for not bringing it up but I um, on screen, but I believe that you can save the pen table out so that they can see how your pens are set up. But I don't think, unless it's changed recently, that you can import a pen table. Usually, from my experience, they're only using a small number of pens, even though there are 255 or 256, they may only use 10 or 20 or 30 in regular practice. So you just want to get those pens set up, and the rest of them you can just leave in thin colors. So all right, I see some comments well done from Michael. I learned a lot. Jay must depart. There's a good format for webinars. Carminas is a very useful webinar. I'm very interested in the next one. And I dare to propose Cinema 4D, the great addition to Arcade 18. OK, um, so Miroslav, I guess I answered the wrong question about polylines. If I made a polyline from lines, custom made, then draw it, sometimes it's the wrong orientation. So I'm not quite sure about the orientation question there. Um, and Muaz says, nobody can train Eric Archicad like Eric. Well, thank you very much, Muaz. I appreciate that. Um, OK, so uh, we'll finish up. Uh, please um, add comments and questions. Uh, I believe we'll, this will be posted on the YouTube channel, and you'll be able to post questions there. Uh, I may also put it on the Archicad user website. I want to thank all of you who've joined me today, and for those of you who 
have uh, signed up on the Archicad user website for the directory. Um, it's great to build a community. It's one of the things I love doing. Um, I love sharing my knowledge and helping you be more successful with Archicad. So uh, have a great day or evening, wherever you are. This has been Eric Bobro. Thanks for watching.